to another episode of the Real Estate Playbook. This is episode 61, and this week's guest is none other than Mike. Mike, how you doing today? I'm doing great. How you doing today, Joe? Excellent, excellent. So, uh, how you been? Doing pretty well. Uh, just super excited with uh, the transition and uh, just with everything that's going on in the market right now. Awesome, man. So, obviously with the transition, welcome to 54 Realty, recently joining us, uh, coming from you know, having a successful run at another brokerage. Um, dealing with the market, you know, obviously you're dealing with the transition market. Also, one thing is dealing with the transition with a brokerage. How, how's that been treating you? It's been actually pretty good. I, I actually feel like I got some really good training. I built a really good foundation for my real estate career. And um, I just kind of had that urge for wanting more. So, um, so kind of, you know, reached out and spoke with you obviously and some others and um and this broker just kind of had the setup i was looking for um to grow myself grow my business and to what i kind of envision it to be awesome man yeah i know one thing and i'm glad we have you on as a guest this week and not speaking about 54 in particular but with changing brokerages i think there's a lot of times a realtor might be contemplating that you know, they might go through months, possibly even years mm -hmm. of, you know, thinking a move is going to make uh, more financial sense for them, better business opportunity, better fit for culture, whatever it might be. But yet they kind of freeze up, you know, maybe it's fear, maybe it's stress, anxiety of making the move. What were some things that you might give advice to an agent thinking of making a move to another brokerage that they feel might be a better fit for them at where they're at with their career or maybe a better culture fit? Well, the biggest thing that I ran into personally was timing. Is there a right time to make that transition and make that switch? They and, say sooner than later, right? Yeah. I mean, honestly, <laughs> there was no right time. I kept, you know, saying to myself, ah, you know, maybe, maybe I'll branch out and, and see if there's, you know, what else is out there just to kind of experiment and just never had the urge to per pull that trigger and, you know, just personal things within my life, uh, kind of jolted me to make that transition so um again i don't think there's a right time I, I think you just need to dive right in and go for it and just have the confidence within yourself to be able to to pick yourself up and you know keep going all right makes perfect sense let's back up a little bit why don't you tell us a little bit about kind of why you decided to become a realtor you know what started this transition into real estate um, where you're at, how long you've been in the business, things like that. Um, I, the reason I even thought about becoming a realtor is when I bought my house about 11 years ago, hmm. um, <clears throat> we went through the process. Uh, our realtor was my wife's aunt. Okay. So uh, we had a lot of that one-on-one -on -one experience. She broke everything down. She was terrific at that too. I, I mean, I credit her with her building that fire within me of want to do this. Mm -hmm. So, um, but yeah, buying my first house was the trigger to kind of get me um, uh, just wanting more information on what this entails and if it's something I could consider as a career path. And I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So you're still going, right? Exactly, exactly. So I guess it was the right move. And, and then prior to real estate, so obviously you bought the house. Um, with your aunt, um, you know, being part of that transaction, you know, being involved, you know, probably more a more intimate level with being a family member, starting to kind of get a, a love for real estate, a passion for getting into the business. What were you doing prior to that? I worked for a uh, publishing, as a psychological publishing company. Hmm. Um, they would distribute um, intelligence testing, personality testing. Um, all kinds of different, you know, like school tests for, for students in schools to see where they're, you know, how they're developing. Um, so I was in that industry for almost 10 years. I was there. Um, Love the workplace, the environment. And, and for me, it's all about the people that I'm around. Absolutely. And if I'm not happy where I'm at, it doesn't matter how much money you make or anything like that. You got to be happy with the people that you're going to be around regularly. Mm -hmm. So um, everything was going great. It's just I had that passion and desire to want to do something else and just grow mm -hmm. as a human being. So uh, that was what, and it was a slow transition. That whole process that I decided I want to do it to the moment that I actually started practicing took two years. Okay. So it, it was a slow process. Uh, you know, I went out and took the testing and I passed the first exam. 
And then I didn't take the state exam for a full year. Wow. Big mistake. But I passed on the yeah. second try. There you go. So, um, so then I, you know, I passed that test, and it was another year after that before I actually decided to start practicing real right. estate. So, uh, Mike, with that company you're working with, the psychological testing, what exactly was your role there? Was it sales? Was it something else? I actually worked in the uh, distribution center part of it. We um, would contr uh, quality control all the products that would come into our office, and then um, we had a system. It was a, a, a three-checklist system. Mm -hmm. So one person would go through all the, uh, the items that are supposed to be shipped out, and then the second person would double check those items, and the third person is literally triple checking before it gets sent and put into the packages before they're sent out. So we would send out 70, 80, 100 packages, 100,000 packages a year. Wow. So, um, and we, if worst year was like five or six mistakes in that year. That's insane. So we did a, a really good job of priding ourselves That's on detail. being perfect, yeah. as perfect as possible. So obviously we're human, we're still gonna make mistakes, but. Um, I think that helped me to be as a de as detailed as I am today. Mm -hmm. um, so that was part of my growth. I feel like within that company, and um, you able to transition those skills. Correct. To real estate. Correct. So um, again, I really loved working there. I just I need more. Right. Just need a little bit more. That makes perfect sense. As far as just out of curiosity, the testing part. Were you? I know you were kind of packaging, making sure you know T's are crossed, I's are dotted. How did they come, just out of curiosity, like the, the questioning for it? Did you ever uh, see, like, you know, get behind the scenes of how those questions were put together, formatted, or any part of those, like, brainstorming? I was definitely dealing with meetings? very intelligent people. I mm -hmm. mean, we're, uh, m mostly psychologists, yeah. you know, PhDs, and they're the ones who are developing these products. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I always felt like when I was talking to some of the, you know, my colleagues, I'm like, are they psychoanalyzing me? You know, like, hold on a second. So, uh, so that part, you're always like, I was a little a like, mm, hold on a second. Let me make sure. But, uh, um, but it was a great company. I, I just, I really enjoyed the people I worked with, but as far as like being around it and, um, we had to test to get in the company. Okay. So we had to take a personality test. We had to take, it was like a career assessment test where it kind of, they try to determine what should be your career path. You know, what are certain fields that could be more capable, you know, better for you, better suited for you. So you remember what your results were? Um, my result, if I got the job, that means I answered the questions they wanted me to answer for that position at the time. Right. So yes, I did answer and pass, so that's good for that. Um, but, um, but yeah, so we, we did have to experience some of that testing. Okay. And did you, did that help in, because I'm trying to learn, you know, more from real estate agents and especially ones that can get into production, not only quickly, but maintain it, grow, accelerate, and then maintain their success at a high level. Like what are some of the attributes, maybe some of the skill sets they picked up prior to real estate? Obviously one is attention to detail. What I'm, I guess I'm trying to figure out is like the psychological a aspect. Obviously, you know, sales is a lot of that is backed by psychology, understanding humans, how to talk, communicate, tonality, body, posture, all that great stuff. Did any of those testing or meetings like around that help prepare you for more of a sales job? Because prior to real estate, it sounds like you didn't have sales experience. Is that right? Yeah, done. Um, I think it's just some of it has to do with me personally, because um, I just like working with people. I like people and I like people from all walks of life. Some are tough to talk with, work with. Others are really easy to talk with and work with. It's all about those experiences. Um, so I I think where it helped me was being around a bunch of psychologists. You know, they, they ask certain questions and, and I was kind of observant of, of what they're doing. I, I, obviously, I'm no PhD, but right. um, I use that to study who I'm working with. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, I want to determine the personality I'm working with and how I can interact with them to mm -hmm. make this as seamless possible. Because I, I want my clients to understand that I'm always looking out for their best interests right. from start to finish and even after closing. If there's something that comes up, call me. Right. So that just, again, helped leapfrog me uh, into the industry because I've kind of worked with people who work with people. Mm -hmm. so, um, so I think that was helpful for me. In this now, now, obviously, those are some of the skills and kind of learning that that kind of help you 
early on in your career, and then you you be able to, you were able to kind of build on that. But what was something like when you made the jump? Obviously, taking a couple of years to kind of finally make that leap of faith. What was something in real estate you didn't expect, or maybe something didn't go the way you thought it would go? Um, I would say just early on, I really struggled with how to manage expectations with clients and that I, I think that's the biggest key on the front end with people is mm -hmm. just managing expectations, uh, being within the market, be, you know, boots on the ground. You know, you, you, you got to know what's going on to, to educate your buyers to understand what they're getting into because I honestly, I don't want to sell a house to somebody who, do, who doesn't know what they're getting into mm -hmm. and, and I'll never push anybody into something. The house is going to sell itself. So mm -hmm. I just need to educate them on what they're getting into and in expectations afterwards too. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that's key on the front end. With Yeah, I definitely, I definitely do. Like I always say, you know, as you grow in any career, especially sales, you're going to know your rebuttals or objections that kind of come up, why somebody might be on the fence or not, so it's best to advise them and give them that knowledge as part of your consultation, so that way they're aware of it all. Because I think the most, the biggest reason that I feel from my experience that people freeze up is uncertainty, right? Mm -hmm. They're not confident in a decision they're making due to A, not having the information, or B, maybe getting the information, but not trusting it for whatever reason. Correct. So I think by you kind of being that more of an advisory role, kind of giving that consultation, give them all the knowledge, letting them take their time, especially if it's more buyer-centric, through their home search, where that information starts to process, starts to resonate with them. I think as you know the buying process is on, they see more and more homes, they're more comfortable making that offer rather than if all these questions are unanswered and you kind of get ready to that offer stage. Correct, correct. And I, and I bring some of my background in, into this as well. I have a brother-in-law and um, a father-in-law who are both general contractors, not in the state of Florida, but um, just through experiences with them and my experiences and my past work history, um, I'm able to kind of just advise clients on things to look for, you know, with houses. And, and even if you know, you're buying a house that everything looked good on the inspection, I mean, I bought my house and within like the first few months, my refrigerator broke, my stove broke, my AC broke. So again, setting those expectations that mm -hmm. things can go wrong at any point in time, even right after closing, even mm -hmm. though it said everything was good on the inspection. So managing that and when things do come up, there's not a panic mode. Right. There's no panic within them. They're like, oh, Mike, hey, you, you told me about this. You know, what can I do about it? You yeah. know, how can I get it fixed? Right. So I never typically get clients that call me like, oh, this broke, that broke. I'm so mad. Mm -hmm. I tell them, even at close, like, things are going to happen. Be prepared. Right. So um, so that's what I just try to do with, with, with all my clients and just spreading the, the information. Yeah. And, and that's pretty much all you can do is giving them the advice, giving them the information. That way when something happens, you know, in a particular situation, as you brought up, stove, fridge, AC, roof, you have vendors too. So they're probably calling you, Mike, you told me about this, you wanted it, do you got anybody you could recommend? Exactly. Those are probably more of the phone calls that you're getting. Exactly. And that's typically, and I do that and they're super happy and I check in with them later just to make sure it got all repaired and they're thrilled, you know? Okay. And so I, I enjoy that. I enjoy those phone calls when they're still happy, even though things go bad, yeah. you know, things happen, so. Absolutely. Now, obviously we know that the market's starting to transition a bit. Uh, what are some things, or I would say, not some things, what is the one thing you're doing right now, maybe you know, you're all in on or doubling down on uh, to kind of brace yourself for the market as we transition a little bit uh, to ensure that you're going to have that level of success that you've experienced over the past couple of years? Um, <clears throat> just me being knowledgeable of the market and being able to explain to my clients where things are at and setting expectations on the front end. Because I would rather explain all this information to them, spend 20, 30, 45 minutes with the client, and then they decide, you know what, maybe this is not a good time. But at least they know the information. Mm -hmm. So six months, a year down the road, you know, I'll check in with them again. Hey, you know, are you, are you ready to pick things back up? You know, here's where the market's at. I feel like those clients end up being some of the best clients, just being on the front end of things and sharing information. And um, so that's kind of, how I try to approach that with this current market is just explain to them where things are at. Yeah, and I would call that more of a trust approach, which kind of builds more, you know, it's a slower cycle, you're more turtle less than the kind of the hair sprinting to get the contract in, but we all know, you know, the story of, you know, it's not about 
point in a sprint, it's about who can finish the race. Correct. And then just having that, building that database. But when they are ready to transact because you weren't so pushy and aggressive, they're probably already trusting you like, hey, it's probably easier to getting them to move through the process when they really find a home or they're in that kind of purchase mode and ready Correct. to buy. Correct. Correct. And it's building that rapport with them. I, I'm... This is the largest purchase that anybody's ever going to buy in their life, is buying a house. Mm -hmm. So I want them to feel 100% comfortable from start to finish, not any hesitation or uncertainty about if this is the right house, this is the right time. So all that, I try to get all that on the front end with them. Um, so, because I don't like to cancel yeah. anything. <laughs> I don't like to cancel. Yeah. So I'd rather you tell me we don't even submit the offer versus we're going to contract. Well, you wasted money on a home inspection. I wasted time on going through this process and putting everything together just for you to tell me I had cold feet. I don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. So again, it's managing those expectations in the front end as much as possible so we can avoid any potential things that may happen in the contract and where they're going to lose money. I, ultimately, I don't want my client, clients to move, lose time mm -hmm. or money. Mm -hmm. I want them to get through the entire process with every expectation has been told to them and so on and so forth. Awesome. So next thing I want to bring up that I know one thing most agents struggle with, um, they're always kind of looking for guidance on is work-life balance. Now I believe married with a son? Two kids. I have a daughter and a son. Okay, daughter and a son. Mm -hmm. So I do apologize for that. Married with two kids. I know one thing that's very important to you just in our brief conversations is family time, the quality time there with the kids, with the wife. What are some things that you do to help you create a work-life balance where you're able to achieve a high level of success in the field, but you're able to still be there for your wife and kids and enjoy the things that you like to partake in? Um, <clears throat> it leads back to kind of managing expectations with clients. Mm -hmm. And, and when, when I talk with them, you know, hey, if I don't answer you or I can't take your call right now, I'll give you a call back as soon as I can. It's usually within hours, less than 24 hours for sure. So... Um, so that's one way I, that I manage that. Um, what was the rest of your question again? I'm sorry. Just kind of like, what are some things that you do to kind of create that? You know, if, if there's a governor in place, things that you, you know you're having a high level of success in real estate, but you're also able to partake in things that you personally enjoy and still, you know, have activities there for your wife, kids, all that good stuff. Like, what are some governor safeguards you put in place to ensure? that you have that one of them, it sounds like setting expectation with your clientele. Yep, and okay. then the other item was um, just putting your putting your personal stuff down on your calendar mm -hmm. as well. So just as I would create an appointment for a client, I do the same thing for my kids. So I pick my kids up and I drop them off every day at school. So mm -hmm. that time frame between like eight and nine, unavailable. From like four to five, unavailable. Oh, but I'll call you before or afterwards, so it's mm -hmm. not like it's the entire day. So right. I just create that time for myself and for my kids and for my family. Um, so that is, is how I kind of create that wor work life balance for myself and not being able or not being afraid to tell people no. Right. And you, I think you have to, that's one thing that I'll talk to a lot of agents, especially newer ones is what I call reverse engineering the calendar, right? Take the blank canvas, fill in your personal obligations, then take in your family, I friend obligations, whatever it is. And all that blank white that you're going to see in the calendar is where you kind of fill in with work. Correct. And that's one of the great things about being in real estate. The thing that I noticed that most agents struggle with is the discipline, mm -hmm. right? It's filling, Correct. It's filling in the white space with work and not going to happy hour at a beach for an entire month. Correct, you know correct. I, mean? I love the work. So <laughs> me, that's never, it never an issue. As a matter of fact, it's like I got to make time for my kids and my family. It's the other way around for me. Right. So, um, so yeah, definitely just being able to put everything on the calendar and that's how you're going to create that balance. And family's first. Mm -hmm. If something comes up, Unfortunately, I'm, that's that's why I'm going first, and I'll have to cancel whatever whatever else is behind that. But um, but I, I I have a good support system. I think that's, that's another awesome. thing to bring in too. You got to have that's good huge. support, and if you don't, it does make your work life balance a little iffy. So um, my dad's been a tremendous help for us. He lives like ten minutes from my house. He picks my kids that's up awesome. occasionally. So if I have work in the evening time, something come up, I can give him a call. He can pick my kids up. No, you know, I didn't lose. I didn't skip a beat. So, um, so I think that's help, helpful as well. So even if it's not family, you got to have some kind of support system if you have kids or other things that you tend pick to. Pick them up, yeah. And even, you know, on work-related, a car breaks down, you need somebody to pick up your kids. Just having somebody there for you Correct. that you can depend on makes it almost like you have a safety net. Exactly. And so that, that, all those things, I, help, I think, help create that work-life balance. Awesome, man. So there's, you know, obviously there's a lot of new agents that are kind of 
coming into the marketplace, uh, you know, a lot less now than probably eight months ago. <laughs> I bet. But, but still, you know, everybody with that passion that you had, you know, they were on the fence for a couple of years. And there's been agents who are licensed, you know, that maybe they thought the market was good and maybe depending on the time they got in, they're struggling or maybe they even got in at a good time with the wrong, you know, not the right fit for them, right mm -hmm. culture. And they might be struggling in business. If you were to give one tidbit of advice to so a struggling agent or a brand new agent on how to start getting into production and start, you know, getting the wheels in motion and having some success that so they can start to compound. What would be your one takeaway, your one nugget of advice that they could start taking action on immediately? Well, it, I'm going to give two, two answers here. One is, for me, I like the team setting. Mm -hmm. So a team setting within a, a, real, you know, a real estate office was super helpful because mm -hmm. I was able to bounce ideas off of others who were more experienced than myself. And, and be able to get that help that I needed when it came up. So real estate team, I think, is key for especially agents who are inexperienced or, uh, you know, or new to the industry, whatever it is. I think that being on a team or being around people who are more experienced that can help you with that is going to be key for your growth. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't have that and you're trying to wing this, I have a friend of mine who just got his license and he's trying to build his business on his own. I go, if I was a new buyer and you're an agent and you're on your own, completely on your own, and you know, I call you to converse with you, I can sense that you probably lack confidence when you're talking to me and that you are kind of inexperienced and knowledgeable about the industry right now because you don't have anything, you don't have any experience right now. So. I suggested to him, I said, you should join a team because I feel like you, you'll have the backing of experienced agents. You'll have the safety nets that they have in place to help you grow yourself and, and build the confidence that you need for the real estate industry. Mm -hmm. So um, if you don't have that as an option or don't want to use as an option and you're an independent agent now, I would get online, network with other agents, talk to other people. Being around experienced agents, I think, could help with inexperienced or new agents with our growth. So what I'm hearing though, if I kind of break Sorry. it down, is obviously the team's gonna be the easiest way to find it, but it's almost like you're finding a culture or possibly even an ecosystem of like-minded people of different experience levels that are all willing to contribute and help each other. Correct. Does that sound about 100%. right? 100%. Yeah, and that definitely goes a far way. And it's, I think that goes to like the culture of the brokerage that you're at. You know, some brokerages you'll go to, especially like these flat fees, right? You go there 100% shops, You'll go in, yes, it'll, as far as a commission percentage, nobody's going to beat them, but nobody's ever in the office. There's not the culture. And for a new for a new agent, it's kind of tough to get into production, not to say it's impossible. Correct. But it's very difficult without having the resources or being around people and bouncing ideas or questions off. Now, like you said, too, you can get online, pay for coaching, get in coaching groups. There are different avenues you can Correct. take. But I definitely agree being part of some kind of ecosystem of different levels, uh, you know, where A, you're learning from the people above you, but be you're reciprocating and contributing what you learn to the people kind of below. Correct, correct. And, you know, for instance, when I started real estate, I started with a group of guys, a, a group of other people as well. So we're all in this experience together. And some of us are taking in information from this aspect, and some of us are taking it from that aspect. So being around those other people who are in the same boat as you where you're bouncing ideas and stuff off of each other as well as learning from the experienced agents i just think that just it's an explosion of growth Absolutely. for any person as an agent coming into the industry like the compound effect it right? truly it's is a, it's a compound massive. effect when you when you kind of have that setting uh to kind of build yourself up build your build your 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 own company, your own business. Well, I even know too, when I was starting my career, just being in a, a, an office where there was other agents working. And even if I wasn't able to collaborate or they were busy, it was different setup, you know, I wasn't going to them for ideas. I would just sit there like a fly on the wall. And while I'm working, listen, just listening to conversations, listening to problems I was going to have yep. that I yet wasn't dealing with and understand the language patterns, the tonality and how, and how to handle these things that kind of came up. But just being around that environment. Exactly. And I mean, I'm somewhat of a seasoned agent at this point, but I still love to come in the office. Even with newer agents, there's things I can learn from anybody. Absolutely. Any single I human agree. being. So I try to be observant and try to keep my ears open just to see if there's some idea or something that could help me mm -hmm. as a person. So um, 
So I'm, I, I love to talk with people and from all walks of life because you never know what you can learn from somebody. Absolutely, man. Enjoy that. So what was that? So that was one. You said you had two things. Do you remember the second one? The second one was was basically just find, finding some kind of tools. You know, like you said, coaching is what you had mentioned. So mm -hmm. either a team or being able to, um, you know, find some kind of education, whether it's social media, watching videos, YouTube. I mean, you can get a lot of information off of YouTube. 100%. Um, so th there's, there's a lot of different avenues out there. You just have to look for it. And, um, if not, I mean, use the basic resources that you have, go to GTAR. They have free classes over there that you can go at any point in time and, you know, learn about appraisals, inspection reports, things that can help you grow as an agent without having to pay for anything. Yeah. And for those of you who don't know, GTAR is one of our MLS boards here in the Tampa Bay area. So, you know, depending on where you're listening to this from it's just going to your local board there's classes you know getting around agents and kind of partaking in that and just upping your skill level and being around like-minded people likewise yeah definitely definitely well mike we greatly appreciate your time for any buyer or seller in the marketplace in the bay area um, who's thinking about buying or selling or possibly even both or maybe it's an agent tuning in to this week's podcast and they they have a buyer or seller that they're looking to refer to another agent who works this area What's the, we're going to go ahead and share all your information awesome. on this on all our sites. But what's the best uh, phone number and email address for anybody to reach you on? Well, again, my name is Mike Flores. Uh, you can reach me at 813-368-1656. And my email is mike.flores at 54realty.com. So feel free to give me a call at any time. I'd love to find you your dream home. All right. Well, we greatly appreciate you taking the time for uh, this week's episode, Mike. Thanks. And thanks for everything appreciate that you do. Appreciate it. Take care. You too.